Perhaps you have noticed that an amazing thing is happening in this country. Mycophilia, the love of mushrooms, is sweeping the nation. And one of the reasons for that is because of a new documentary film that has been a smash hit all over the country called uh, Fantastic Fungi. And this is the accompanying booklet. You can see uh, how mushrooms can heal, shift consciousness, and save the planet. Paul Stamets is one of the main people in the film. You will be hearing more about him as we continue. But before we get started, I just wanted to uh, put a plug in for um, my organization, Minnesota Mycological Society. I hear you can see, um, let me get my laser pointer here. Okay, so you can see, we go all the way back to 89. Uh, our society was started by female physician, Mary S. Whetstone, back <clears throat> at that time. So we do a lot of fun and interesting things. We take people out in the woods to look for mushrooms and to help identify them. And actually mushroom identification is one of our missions. Uh, is, so joining the mushroom club is the best way to learn how to identify mushrooms. Um, we are also a scientific organization, so we are working on uh, projects to document uh, the diversity of mushrooms uh, in Minnesota. Okay, here's a look at these mushrooms. Uh, boy, aren't they fantastic. So I think mushrooms are, just, are absolutely fantastic for all kinds of reasons. I mean, here you can see that they're colorful and uh, uh, they're strange and bizarre, like this is a netted stink horn. Uh, here's one that's, that's good for curing cancer. And would you believe that uh, mushrooms can form birds' nests with eggs in them? And uh, this beautiful mushroom happened to be uh, Julius Caesar's favorite mushroom. It is called Amanita Caesarea. So um, mushrooms can, uh, can heal you and they can kill you. Also, what you can't see here are some of the, the odors and textures that mushrooms have. So. Um, Actually, some of the odors we have uh, range from almond, maraschino cherry, raw potatoes, corn silk, radish, garlic, bread dough, some pleasant ones, and then there are unpleasant ones like rotting flesh and uh, sewer gas. Okay, so here's uh, the plan for this evening. Um, we're going to be talking about fungi in general first, and we're going to be talking about how they got here, how they evolved, and then we're going to zero in on the relationship of fungi to other life on Earth and how important they are, in fact, essential that they are for the, for the health of our ecosystems and, in fact, the whole planet. Um, and then finally, we will actually get into mushrooms, and you'll see a large variety of uh, uh, beautiful, poisonous, edible, and, and a lot of other kinds of mushrooms. And we will um, talk some about how you add the basics of mushroom identification. Okay, the five kingdoms of life. When I was in college back in the 1960s and you wanted to learn about mushrooms or fungi, you took a course in botany because uh, fungi were considered plants back in those days. Well, that in 1969, it was realized that mushrooms are really entirely different than plants. In fact, they are more like animals than they are like plants. 
And in fact, we are uh, actually more related. To, uh, mushrooms, you could say, are our distant cousins. Uh, these other two kingdoms, these are uh, protozoas, and then these are, are bacteria. So this five kingdom system uh, is the easiest one for most people to make sense of. And in the, in the intervening years, uh, this, the, the tree of life has gotten more and more complicated, but this, this kind of covers, covers it well. So here is uh, the, the five kingdoms of life in, in a tree form, the tree of life. You see the five, the five kingdoms. And here you can see plants are autotrophic. That means they, uh, autotrophic means to feed. Uh, they feed themselves. They make their own food with uh, carbon dioxide and sunlight. So both animals and fungi are heterotrophic. That means we have to eat stuff. We have to eat organic compounds, um, fruits, vegetables, animals and plants um, in order to, to live. So the thing to notice here is that actually uh, fungi and animals actually come from a common, set, common, common ancestor maybe 800 to a billion uh, years ago. And another thing I have on here, like joining uh, fungi and plants, this is a re really important event that happened 450 million years ago. And this is when plants came onto land. And it turns out that uh, fungi really prepared the land for plants. And then when the plants did get here on the land, they were accompanied in a with uh, fungi and a and a symbiotic relationship uh, with the fungi and the roots of the of the plants. Um, going back that far, we have uh, fossils uh, showing uh, fungi and animals, um, fungi and plants together back in those days. So again, in the big scheme of things, so plants are the producers, animals are the consumers, and then. Fungi are the great decomposers, the great recyclers of life on Earth. Um, so let's move on to some frequently asked, some questions about fungi. So how many fungi are on, on Earth? Well, it turns out there are a phenomenal number. Um, there's a uh, 120,000, these are ones that have been documented by science, but now the estimate, it used to be 1.5 uh, million species, but uh, in more recent years, they're thinking it could be up into the, like closer to three, three and a half million. And uh, this is a result of finding in the soil and in the ocean using DNA sequencing, like many, many more um, species that we didn't know about because uh, we couldn't grow them in a lab. Okay, how many species, how many species of mushrooms? Okay, so, so fungi include lots more than, than mushrooms. And how many species of mushrooms? Okay, well, um, 50,000 is, is an estimate in the world, and 10,000 in North America. How about Minnesota? Uh, last time I checked, it was uh, 12,000 known species, and we probably have uh, 5,000 species in Minnesota. So uh, part, part of what we are doing as a club is we are trying to uh, document all as many of the species in Minnesota as we can and and actually using uh, DNA sequencing to do that. How about poisonous species? Well, you know, there's not as many as you might think out of all those mushrooms, maybe 400, 400 species. Uh, so in North America, we have at least 250 species. Okay, how many deadly species? Turns out there's only um, a handful of lethal species, that's good. 
there are only two uh, main lethal mushrooms that we found in Minnesota, edible species, probably 2,000. Um, and some of those are edible, but not incredible. You probably would never eat them again. And so then we have about good edibles. Okay, well, there's probably a hundred species of good edibles. And I have eaten, I myself have eaten over a hundred different species. And commonly eaten, uh, maybe 15 to 30 species. So in Minnesota, we can find, uh, yeah, we can find 30, 30 good, in some cases, choice edible species. And then in, uh, in the past, uh, especially 10 or 15 years, uh, medicinal mushrooms are starting to become prominent and recognized. And so uh, you will find rows and rows of medicinal mushrooms in many of you, in your co-ops and in Whole Foods and um, um, other places. Okay. So, all right. And then here's the, you know, the most basic question. It may seem kind of kind of, um, you know, what is a mushroom? Well, we know mushroom. We know mushrooms a fungus. All right, well, what else? Okay, a mushroom is, is a reproductive organ, it's a fruiting body. So it is a fruiting body like an apple is a, is a fruiting body on the tree. So when you pick a mushroom off the ground, you are just picking the, the reproductive organ and most of the organism is going to be under underground, or maybe in a log if it's growing on um, growing on um, wood. Okay, so if, usually if I say mushroom, something like this comes to your mind. You have it's kind of an umbrella shape. It has a cap and a stem, and then it has these radial blades that we that are the gills. Okay, so actually, let's come up with uh, a, a, actually a definition for what a mushroom is. So a mushroom is any large fleshy fungus. It's a, a fleshy macro fungus. So how large is large? Well, okay, there's a, certainly a large giant puffball mushroom. Go down to Central America. And you you might find this monster mushroom. However, here is also a, a large fleshy fungus. So this is large in contrast to say something like a like a mold, which uh, produces spores. And but you can't you need a microscope microscope to uh, really um, really see the see the mold up close. Speaking of huge mushrooms, um, I, got a, I got an email from uh, this person in, in um, Austin, Texas, and she had this growing in her basement. And this actually uh, is probably the same species as that, the one that the Central American guy had. And it seems that these, these monster mushrooms are are moving northward. They are in Florida, they're in Texas, and uh, probably due to uh, climate change, they're moving north. Okay, so what are fungi made of? So what you're seeing here, fungi are made of mycelium. Okay, this is mycelium you're looking at here, this white fuzzy stuff. Uh, what this this is oyster mushrooms growing on um, on coffee grounds. So you can grow grow uh, oyster mushrooms on coffee grounds. It's pretty easy. So this is mycelium. So the mushroom is made of mycelium, and um, the stuff that is growing on contains contains the mycelium also. And then, so you're seeing, what you're seeing here is mycelium is actually a mass of even tinier little threads called hyphae. Hypha, singular hyphae, plural. And under a microscope, uh, 
these these are change of chains of tubular uh, tubular cells that uh, branch out and and um, connect back together, forming a network. And just to give you a, an idea of some scale on these things, so what we have here is, looks like a telephone pole is a human hair, and here is a hyphae. So you can see there they are very tiny. So you get a mass of hyphae makes a mycelium. So here we have, a, so the whole mushroom here is made of hyphae, but then uh, the mushroom is coming from hyphae that is, that is underground, and this is the major part of the organism. And here you can see some of the, the mycelium that's in wood chips. Okay. So here's a mushroom growing. They start off as little primoidea. And notice here that um, we have this vast network here which can go way, way, way beyond the mushroom that you pick. So this big, this is a vast underground network of uh, mycelium. And so this whole big mass is in communication with each other. And when the time and the conditions are just right, signals are generated that tell the mycelium to clump up together to, and to go through some mor morphogenetic change and form these, these beautiful, amazing uh, mushrooms. So it's something to remember is, uh, okay, we gotta go this way. So everywhere you walk in, in nature, you're walking on top of mycelium. So under your foot, if you got all of the hyphae and you stretch them out and, and uh, together, it would it would uh, go on for 300 miles. Okay, so have you heard of the humongous fungus? Actually, the humongous fungus made made the newspapers uh, back in 1992, Crystal Falls, Michigan. Uh, they found this humongous fungus, and it turned out at the time to be the lar largest organism in the world. So they're showing these the humongous as being big mushrooms, but the mushrooms are just like your ordinary little, maybe you know, six inches high. But what is humongous is this big network that's underground, and so that big network was like as big as 1,600 football fields. It weighed 100 tons, and was very ancient. And since then, in Oregon, they found some some bigger humongous fungus candidates. And um, I th the biggest one that I've heard of now covers like almost four square miles and is like maybe, uh, could be 8,000 years old. Okay, so now it's time to look at, uh, we saw what fungi are made of, so let's look at how they make their living in, in nature. So one of the lifestyles is called uh, saprotrophic. This is probably the major one. And this is the, uh, where, the, where uh, the mushrooms uh, are decomposing dead organic material. And like I said, they are the great recyclers of nature. By the way, sapro means dead, trophic means to feed on. So uh, what's really important is when they break down all that organic debris, they create soil. If there weren't mushrooms around to break that stuff down, we would be literally miles deep in, uh, in, in organic debris. So, and then, so think if we didn't have if we didn't have soil, we wouldn't have plants. If we didn't have plants, we wouldn't have animals, and we would not be here. And also, um, we will see coming up here that plants and, and um, fungi have cooperated together for, for millennia, and, um, and plants have created uh, oxygen 
in our atmosphere. So that's another reason why we would not be here if, if it weren't for fungi. So there, unfortunately, unfortunately, there are um, parasitic fungi uh, on plants, on animals. So fungal pathogens uh, have been a great scourge of humanity going back, you know, to ancient days. There's been uh, famines that are the result of um, plant, you know, crop failures due to fungi, and um, you know, there's there's a bunch of uh, uh, fungal diseases of animals and humans. Some of them quite awful, and most, you know, and then there's the common parasites that we might have. Uh, think of uh, athlete's foot, jock itch, uh, yeast infections. So this is the one that I really want to emphasize and really stands out. Um, this is a mutualistic or symbiotic relationship that uh, fungi and plants have gotten together and have become partners. So that relationship is between the fungus and the roots of the plants and it's called, myco it's called a mycorrhizal association. So I mean, okay, that's a weird word. It just myco is fungus. So whenever you see myco, that means fungus. Rhiza is root. And here's some examples. Um, morel mushroom, um, our state mushroom. We all, we're all familiar with that. And this is the beautiful Amanita muscaria mushroom that you've seen in, in books and in art and cards. And it's the most, um, the most portrayed mushroom in media by far. Okay, so um, so uh, elms uh, have a relationship with um, mycorrhizal with elm trees. So this is why, um, at least in our area, when you go out looking for morels, you look around dead elm trees, and then the Amanita muscaria has a has a mycorrhizal relationship with conifers and probably some other trees too, and then. Uh, so here's the big point. Most plants, 90%, need the help of fungi for their optimal growth. And then let's not forget algae. I mean, let's not forget lichens, which are also really important, and there's thousands of species. And they are a symbiotic relationship between uh, fungi and algae. So this, let's look further at this uh, myco at the mycorrhizal fungi fungus root so there's actually two types of them which we're going to briefly look at so one type is ectomycorrhizal so ecto means on the outside so this is these this is on talking about on the outside of roots and endomycorrhizal where the fungus actually goes inside of the roots and into the cells. So here is, there's your Amanita muscaria again, and it um, has this relationship with a uh, plant with the root, the root tips mostly. So um, here's, here's the root, and then there's this sheath of fungus that's around the root. So here is um, uh, a, some uh, root, root uh, tips. You can see this sheath of fungus around there and little strands of the fungus coming off. Um, so here is another view. So you can see the uh, fungus sheath and then um, uh, the, uh, the fungus, is in this case going uh, between the cells and not inside of the cells. So take a little closer. So here you can see the hyphae that are going between and around the cells, the sheath, and then here's these hyphae. So these hyphae are going out way beyond the, um, the root, and these hyphae are 
are tiny and they can get in little nooks and, and crevices that the roots can't get into and, and they will bring in water and, and minerals from way beyond where the, where the tree roots are. Okay, here's the one that's the endomycorrhizal. So these um, actually uh, penetrate inside the cells and when, the, when this happens, uh, well, first of all, what is interesting, there is a communication that goes on. So chemical signals are being given out by the fungus and the, the root that bring them together and then you get a penetration of the cells and then the um, genes are turned on in the plant and in the fungus that allow these structures called arbuscules and vesicles to form. So uh, this type of endomycorrhizal fungi are called uh, BAM, uh, vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae. Here's another picture of it just to give you some uh, a little better idea. So here you see the the root hairs and the hyphae going out and then here's here's uh, minerals being and water being brought in. <clears throat> and our um, arbuscule means little tree and they actually do look like little trees. So this is inside the cell of the, uh, of the root, the plant root. Um, so these are really important. So what happens is when you get this relationship going on, the plant gets access to 15,000%, a 15,000% greater soil volume if, than if the uh, roots weren't there. So the fungi helps to protect, uh, brings water and minerals to the plant. So uh, we have two partners here. We have the plant and the fungus. Both of them are getting something out of this relationship. So. The plants get water and minerals uh, from the fungi, especially minerals like phosphorus. And the fungi uh, get sugars from the, from the plant. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about another type of um, symbiotic fungal relationship called endophytic fungi means inside of the plants. And these, this has only been really looked at in the last, I don't know, 10 years maybe. So this is where it turns out that just about all plants, if you really looked at them, have, have uh, fungi uh, growing inside of them. Here's a hyphae inside. So, and it turns out that this is really important to the plants because these these fungi can, can um, secrete chemicals which can be beneficial to the, to the plant. And um, some, of these, some of those chemicals and compounds have important medicinal properties. And one of the, the best examples of that is the drug Taxol, one of the leading anti-cancer drugs from the Pacific U tree out west. And, you know, they were harvesting this tree thinking that the uh, taxol came from there, but it actually is coming from the uh, endophytic fungi is producing that. And so anyway, this is uh, a, new, a new thing on the horizon looking at all of the different things that uh, endophytic fungi can do. Uh, here's Paul Stamets. We introduce you to Paul Stamets. Remember his name from back in the Fantastic Fungi film. So that so Paul is the leading um, the leading mushroom guru um, worldwide, and he started a company called Fungi Perfecta for mushroom cultivation supplies and equipment. And uh, this, he goes, this goes back into the 1980s. And then in 2005, he wrote a really important book called Mycelium Running, 
And you see the subtitle here, How Mushrooms Can Save the World. And he's really on a campaign to advocate that mushrooms can save the world. So he's kind of like a Michael Messiah. Um, anyway, so uh, this next photo is from the uh, cover of his book. So what I want you to look at here is this, uh, here's a forest. Here you see all the roots of the forest. And then this gray stuff between the roots is, is uh, mycelium. So this mycelium is connecting all the, all the trees and, uh, and other plants in the forest. And this un so there is this underground is actually a uh, like an underground internet and even perhaps like an underground brain of these um, mycelium which are actually they are sentient they sense things going on in the environment and they can make adjustments to help the uh, for to the benefit of the ecosystem as a whole. For example, if uh, here's a, a tree, it's, it some of it um, drops some seeds. Some of the seedlings are coming up, and they're overshadowed by some other other stuff, and they're not getting enough sunlight. So this, say, the mother tree can can send some sugars through the mycorrhizal network to the uh, the little sapling that needs some some help. So uh, this underground internet, has now being called the Wood Wide Web, has been, um, you know, is really uh, important. And so Paul Stamets makes the statement, fungi are the primary governors of ecological equilibrium. Now that is a, a big and a profound statement. And he also says, uh, that they are the immune system of ecosystems. So what that might be, what that's referring to is the fact that if an uh, insect pest or, or, you know, comes in on one side of the forest, the uh, underground network can send signals to the other trees, which will tell them to turn on uh, genes to make chemicals that are, um, 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 not herbicidal, but insecticidal. Okay. All right, let's get on to mushrooms. This is what we've been waiting for. So um, I'm going to take one, one more <laughs> delay here is to say that um, there's five major groups of mushrooms. And this one here, glomeromycosis, these are the soil fungi. These are the ones that the arbuscular fungi belong to. So then you have these chytrids. Uh, these were in the news because these are the fungi that are killing off all the amphibians. Here we have bread mold. And then finally we have um, mushrooms are in these two major groups, Basidiomycota, Ascomycota. Mycota. So those names actually do make sense. They mean something. So. Ascomycetes, ascomycata. Ascus means sac in Greek. Sac fungi. So um, there are some mushrooms in in ascomycetes, but there are many, many, many other uh, molds and uh, that are in this group. So um, Okay, so most mushrooms are in this basidiomycete group. This uh, basidium means club, and you'll see, uh, and it's because uh, uh, spores are formed on club-like structures called uh, basidia. Okay, so let's look at some ascomycetes, sac fungi. So. Here's the sac, and it contains these spores. Usually it's eight spores. So in cup fungus here, uh, the inside of this cup is, is covered with these microscopic little sacs, and they will forcibly eject spores into the air, and the wind carries them away. And the best known of all mushrooms is actually an ascomycete, 
and uh, it might seem strange, but morels are actually in the same order as um, cup fungi. Anyway, so many, many ascomycetes are molds, and we have good molds and bad molds. And of course, you know, one of the uh, one of the important things is molds can be uh, sources of antibiotics. And then we have things like uh, mold and cheese. So like, um, and then you have food that can get rotted by fungi. And let us not forget about yeast, which gives us beer, bread, and alcoholic, uh, other alcoholic beverages. So uh, most fungi um, are filamentous with hyphae, but there are some that have kind of reverted to this a single celled growth pattern where there's a single cell and then they reproduce by budding. Okay, and then many yeasts are ascomycetes. So let's take a look at some other ascomycetes. Okay, here we have uh, um, the orange peel fungus, very beautiful and very strange. We have um, dead man's fingers. And here is a picture of coming up here of even a dead man's foot. Um, okay. And we have some beautiful little hairy fairy cups, our ascomycetes. And truffles are an ascomycete that is under the ground. It is a hypogeus uh, mushroom and um, pigs traditionally were used to find them. Truffles give off a scent of like a, a sexual scent of a pig in heat and it attracts, uh, um, I don't know, attracts male pigs, I guess. And, um, and, but now we have found, that, I mean, so most of, of that uh, truffle hunting is done with dogs now because dogs can smell these things and sense them out. And so, anyway, what happens in nature is that these things, like a, a boar in nature, would be attracted to these things. He'd dig them up and eat them. And then he would go roaming away, and then the spores would be disseminated in his droppings. All right, so there's there's thousands of types of mushrooms. So how can you sort all these out? There's a number of ways. For this presentation, I'm going to use a, a method of looking at the shapes of mushrooms and using that as a way of sorting them out. So we're going to be looking at mushrooms that have this uh, typical mushroom shape of like a cat cap and a stem with a, a central stem. And then we'll look at some shelf and bracket, club, coral, crust, jelly, and gastromycetes. Gastro means stomach, stomach fungi. And we'll see why they call them that. So let's take off. And um, so here are some mushrooms that have that typical shape, cap and stem. So mushrooms that have this shape can actually, they can have gills, pores, or teeth as the spore producing um, structures under, underneath the caps. So let's take a look at, a, we'll do a little mushroom anatomy. So there are different parts of the mushroom have different names. They have some, you know, scientific names and then more common names like a cap cap um, cap stem and uh, so then you want to look at so the 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 surface of the cap may have different stuff on it say scales it may or may not have stuff on it uh, the the mushroom may or may not have one of these rings on it um, and it may have um, a a cup at the bottom called a vulva. And so that's an important thing to uh, be aware of when you're, when you're collecting mushrooms. So here is that familiar mushroom. So this is a uh, russula, red russula, called a crumble cap, or there are brittle gill. 
Um, very common. There's lots of different uh, red Brussels mushrooms. Some of them are difficult to identify. Uh, notice uh, the, the surface is fairly smooth, but it's red, and uh, there's no ring on it. So here's another mushroom. This is a honey mushroom, which is an edible mushroom. So you see the gills. You see it has these kind of little hairy, bristly things on the surface, and you see it has a nice ring here. And that ring is, was formed by this membrane that was covering the gills. And so when it's covering the gills, it's called a veil. And then when the mushroom expands, the, the veil uh, drops off and either hangs down there or leaves, uh, leaves a ring on the stem. Okay, here's a gilled mushroom, like really, really tiny. Uh, this is, you know, the size of a match head or a pen head. I mean, it's really small. Um, okay, and here we have a beautiful blue New Zealand uh, entoloma mushroom. Some mushrooms grow on specific uh, substrates, like in this case, this is um, this is a mushroom that grows on uh, white pine cones. Here is like a cool little uh, um, Leucofoliota decorosa that's decorated with these uh, pointy, spiky uh, spines. Uh, it is a gilled mushroom. Okay, and here are some beautiful uh, golden oyster mushrooms. These were some that I cultivated, and uh, so that's something you can do. Gilled mushrooms, okay. Here's a beautiful scarlet waxy cap, gilled mushroom, and a beautiful uh, orange mycena mushroom. And here's a gilled mushroom that's weird in that it is parasitic on another mushroom. Here you can see the black host mushroom. And these uh, mushrooms uh, actually have spores on the top of the, the surface. And finally, um, this is your, another one of your um, beautiful uh, red russell of mushrooms. Okay, now here's that mushroom shape, and we have some that have pores on the bottom. Um, so this one, uh, you can't really see the pores that well, but here's one. This is the chicken fat mushroom, where you can see these spores are pretty pretty prominent, and um, so let's take a closer look. We'll do some mushroom bowley anatomy. So the, uh, so the pores are actually the openings to tubes. So inside the tubes, the spores are formed, and then they are forcibly ejected and then carried away by, by the wind. Um, so you have this tube layer. So here's a bolete cut in half, and here you can see the tube layer. Now in boletes, you can get this tube layer if you, you can just grab it with your fingers, and this will easily separate off. You can tear it off. There's some other mushrooms that have pores called polypores that you cannot do that, and we'll be seeing some of those later on. Okay, we'll look at some other, um, here's some other Boli. This is the most famous of all bolis, the king boli, also called Porcini. We'll talk a little more about that as we go. Actually, let's see. We can do close-ups. I think maybe I'll try a close-up here. So, so there you can see the pores. You can't really see them there. Um, okay, anyway. Uh, here is one that has pores. Um, and what you're seeing is if you scratch the pore surface or cut the mushroom, it turns blue. So uh, this color change is, is amazing and is really important for bolete identification. So uh, here is this, this is called the blueing bolete, Gyroporus cyanus, and this is what it looks like when you find it. And then you cut it, and it instantaneously turns this beautiful blue color. 
And actually this is a, a good edible mushroom, but there are other blue staining boletes that are toxic. So um, you need to know, know what you're doing if you're gonna be eating any mushroom actually. So here, uh, this is some beautiful boletes. This is called the painted, uh, painted suillus. See the pores, and this actually has a veil that covered the pores. And here's a beautiful, um, let's see, this is uh, Boletus ornatopes, ornate stalk. Very cool. Here is a big, beautiful edible mushroom, edible bolete. Um, and there is even, even a parasitic bolete, Boletus parasiticus. So this is growing on another mushroom. This is an earth ball uh, called scleroderma. All right, so here we have that mushroom shape again, and you can see we have teeth, okay. And here's another one that has a cap and a stem that's down here, and it has these little teeth, bleeding tooth fungus. And here's why it is called that, because uh, this, is, this is what it can look like. Okay, so let's look at some other types. I mentioned polypore mushrooms. So a lot of these are shelf bracket, hoof shaped things. And they also have pores on the, under, on the underside. Then we'll look at some other mushrooms with teeth, some coral club, jelly, stomach, and crust fungi coming up. So here are some polypore, typical polypore, Mushroom, so shelf, hoof, uh, bracket, shelf, uh, uh, kind of a, this is an unusual shape. This is the artist conch. I'm going to show this again. I think I'll do it right now. So, uh, by the way, um, all of, pretty much all of these mushrooms are medicinal. But many of the, if not most, most of the Polypore mushrooms have medicinal properties. They have in immune enhancing properties. So this is a real familiar mushroom. You have all seen this if you've walked in the woods. It's called the artist conch. And when it's fresh, it'll have a living white surface on the bottom. And if you get a sharp instrument and you can scratch on it, you can do like an engraving. And where you scratch, it'll turn dark brown. And then when it dries out, it will be permanent, and you'll have uh, you'll have mushroom art. Here's a hoof-shaped uh, polypore, tender polypore. This is this um, this uh, mushroom is very important in human history for starting fires. That's where the tender com uh, name comes from. There's a layer of fuzzy stuff under this hard surface that. Can be can be dried and used to like put a spark on and start a fire. Um, this is one of the mushrooms that was found on the, the now famous Ice Man. His name is Utsi. It was found in the, um, the an Alpine glacier and melting out. And people thought it was a climber that had fell in a crevice. It turns out the guy was. 5,000 years old, and he had all of his equipment and arrows and uh, tools, and and he had carrying on him uh, on a leather thong. He had this mushroom, um, which he probably used for starting fires, and then he had this mushroom. This is the birch polypore, which um, not sure what he was doing with this, but it could have been medicinal. It is purported that. It can um, can be used as a dewormer, a vermifuge, uh, and probably everybody back then had worms. And it is a polypore. And here is uh, this polypore. It's called the Rishi Lynchi Ganoderma lucidum. This uh, this is probably the most esteemed of all medicinal mushrooms been used in Asia for you know, about 4,000 years. So here's what it looks like in nature. Um, and it has this um, uh, 
doesn't show too well here, but a really slick, hard surface that looks like it's been varnished. These don't show it, but um, anyway, uh, these, are, these are being cultivated on buried logs, uh, probably somewhere in Asia. Whoops, backwards, okay. And it's an important medicinal mushroom. Here is a polypore that uh, that is actually soft and fleshy and a, and a really good edible. We'll see a little more of that coming up. Here's a bracket mushroom. This is the turkey tails, like a really important medicinal mushroom. There's a turkey tail extract that's used in Japan that is one of the, the biggest selling cancer drugs in Japan. And it is a polypore. If you turn it over, uh, you'll see uh, pores on the bottom. Let's do a close up here. Okay. Um, all right. And here's a shelf mushroom that has teeth. It's called a northern tooth. Um, grows on maple trees. And if you have a maple tree and this is growing on it, it is not good as a, as a pathogen. It causes heart rot. The tree may, may blow down and eat out the, the middle of the tree. And more uh, mushrooms with teeth. Uh, this is uh, called a lion's mane mushroom. This is a wonderful edible mushroom. Um, we'll, talk, we'll talk a little more about that later. So this can be as big as a softball or even a, even a basketball uh, with these long teeth hanging on it. So this is the genus Herisium, this is Herisium arenaceus. Here is Herisium americanum, and here you see that it has this more branched and has the uh, teeth hanging off branch, the branches. And the teeth are spore-producing um, structures, so you get by making these teeth or gills or another example, you really, you greatly increase the surface area on which to uh, form spores, uh, many more spores than you could get otherwise. Uh, and then here is one that's more of a coral-like uh, erysium, but if you can see that it has the little teeth growing on the coral branches. So look at, let's look at some more coral fungi. They can be quite beautiful. Some, some are edible, some are not. Anyway, we'll just zip through some. Uh, Claveria, this is, there's a bunch of Romeria species that are colored different colors. Whoops, that's a duplicate. Um, okay. This is really a beautiful one here. Um, Club-shaped fungi. So in this and these, the spores are forming on the outsides of these. You know, sometimes they're wrinkled up, sometimes they're smooth, uh, the pedestal-shaped, uh, flat-topped. Um, this is this one is pretty good edible. Here's some other club-shaped fungi. And more dead man's fingers have a club shape. Okay, there are also jelly fungi. These are soft and, you know, they are, they are like, uh, they're jelly-like. Uh, they feel really cool when you squeeze them. Um, one of the more common ones here called witch's butter. And here's some more orange colored uh, jelly fungi in different shapes and forms. And then here is the white, uh, Chinese white fungus. This is a jelly fungus, Tremella fusiformis. Um, this one is actually cultivated in, uh, in Asia and you can buy them dried in um, Asian markets and they are a good edible. I mean, they, they're mostly for texture. They, they have kind of a cartilaginous texture and you can put them in soups and stuff. They're almost like, like noodles. Um, and it's medicinal, lots of vitamin D. Uh, and again, here's a medicinal mushroom that's being marketed uh, for, uh, for your complexion. So it's good for your skin and it's good for your joints. Um, 
and then crust fungi. So you might turn, you might have to turn over a log to see some of these. But uh, you know, you might say, well, that's kind of boring. But remember that this this is doing it, and you know, is this particular one can really break down um, break down wood very very well. Lignin it really works well. To get rid of lignin. Uh, and uh, there are some beautiful uh, crust fungi like this blue velvet spread fungus. All right, now we get to the gastromycetes, the stomach, the stomach fungi. What we're, what is talking about is that the, there is a spore mass, and this this is like immature spore mass here. That this whole thing is covered by a a membrane, and then when it gets mature. Uh, a pore will, will form in the top and you'll have a puffball. So this is an amazing photo because the photographer got four puffballs to puff at the same time. Think about how he might have done that. All right, and uh, yes, actually birds nest fungi, these things are amazing, and they have eggs. Those eggs, remember, so this you have a packet a bunch of spores in a membrane packet. So these are about the size of um, a pencil eraser. And what happens is when a raindrop hits one of these cups, it splashes out and um, some of these have a little tether on it that will stick to a plant or a blade of grass or something and then when a animal comes along and eats it, then it will spread as spores through the animal droppings. Here's another species of uh, bird's nest fungus. Earth stars, um, there's earth stars and earth balls are, uh, you could call them gastromycetes. In this case, you have an, an extra, like a really thick membrane that when it's young covers the whole an inner part, inner membrane here. And when they open up, they have this star shape. Uh, they look like stars. This is the barometer earth star. And this one, when it's uh, dry, it folds up into a little ball. But then when it gets uh, damp, it, open, it opens up and then we'll be able to um, shed some spores. And then we have the most uh, disgusting and obscene mushroom of all called Phallus impudicus, the stink horn. So gastromycetes, because when it's, here it is in its young stage, it's actually in an egg. This is the spore mass enclosed in an egg. And then when this thing hatches within hours, this, this whole thing will emerge with the green slime which is the stuff that smells like maybe rotten flesh or, or I don't know what is is horrible. Uh, you can smell it before you find it. Um, and there's a bunch of different stink horns and mother nature went crazy when she may started making stink horns and look at some of these crazy shapes and forms, but they all stink and they attract flies. And so when the fly, lands on here, it gets spores on his feet and flies away and spreads the fungus. Uh, and here's another one, a netted. This is a netted stink horn, bizarre, stinky, delicious. Yeah, um, Asians, um, they get this mushroom, they wash off the slime, they, they dry it and eat it, and you can buy this. You can buy dried stink horns in in the Asian markets, only they call them bamboo fungus, sounds better than stink horn. And here's one that I'm, one of my, my favorite one, I think, is the stinky squid. All right, now we finally get to uh, how do you identify mushrooms? Okay, first of all, uh, some are really easy. You can probably, you will know some by the time this is over. Some are difficult. And you have to look at a lot of different things, and some uh, some of them you need a microscope. And now we are in the day. This we're in the era of DNA. 
So now um, mycologists and amateur mycologists, in order to say that something is a particular, to identify something as a species these days, you have to get a DNA sequence on it. So they say without a DNA sequence, the species is just a rumor. So this has caused lots of changes in the world of mycology because they're finding out that things that we thought were related are not related and because of that they have to give them new names so there's uh it, within the last uh you know 10 15 years uh the names have been changing like crazy so if you have an older book um the names will will be obsolete um, some of the newer books, it's hard to keep up with these name changes. But if you put the old name in the internet, you can come up with a new name. So anyway, all right. So what? So we're going to talk about guild mushrooms uh, first of all. There may be the the real challenge to identify. Um, so what do you look for when you look at a guild mushroom? Um, so you want to know what color the spores are. So spores are microscopic, so how can you know what color they are? Well, you make a spore print. And we'll see how to do that in a minute. Uh, you look at the cap, the shape of the cap. You look at the features on the cap. Uh, and then you look at the stalk. Does it have a ring, a veil or a ring? What's the shape? Uh, what's the texture? Does it have stuff on the stalk? And then one of uh, kind of a pretty important uh, characteristic is how the gills are attached to the stem and how far apart the gills are spaced. And then also really a key um, thing to, to know is the habitat, the substrate, and the ecology of the um, the area where you're picking up the mushroom substrate is what the mushroom is growing on. All right, so how do you make a spore print? Uh, it's really simple. You just, uh, you get the cap of the mushroom, you uh, cut the stem off, put it on a sheet of paper, cover it with something, glass, a bowl overnight, and you will get a, looks like a print of the bottom of the mushroom, and it'll be a certain color. And that color can be anywhere from pure snow white to pink to to brown all the way to pure jet black okay so anyway i'm just going to quickly go through some things here um okay the shape of the cap you can see and some of these have different names and then the margin of the cap and then the ring on the stem does it have a ring and if it has a ring is it upper or lower what does the ring look like and some um some mushrooms instead of having a veil have this cobwebby it's called a cobwebby veil called a cortina and um and then the stalk, uh, the stalk, where is it placed? Is it in the center? Is it off to the side? Is it totally off to the side? Or is the stem absent? The shape of the stem? What's some stuff that's on the stem? And then this is a uh, Amanita mushroom you may recognize that has the, the cup on the bottom. And this this is called the partial veil that covers the um, covers the gills and then hangs down. And then different uh, different amanitas, uh, you know, will have uh, some of them won't have a distinct cup. It'll just be some fragments. Okay, okay. Now the gill attachments. So they can have free gills. That means the gills are not actually attached to the stem. There's a gap between the stem and where it attaches. Others do attach, and some of them attach and actually run down the stem a ways. That's called decurrent. And you can see the spacing can any be anywhere from uh, crowded to four, I mean, to uh, distant to 
too crowded and then the gills may be forked or, or not. Um, so here's some examples of uh, gill spacing. And here you see you know, this, you get your knife and you cut the gills and a fluid comes out. It looks like milk. Uh, so the mushrooms that do that are, call, are in the group called milky caps. Um, and here's the, um, the gill attachment. Remember the gill, I mean the free gills, okay, a little gap. Here you can see that gap that makes a circular track around the stem. And here's some decurrent so the gills are running down the stem. Okay, and uh, in your handouts, um, I think you have uh, some uh, mushroom keys, uh, keys to gild mushrooms. Um, I think there's keys to polypore mushrooms. Um, anyway, the, um, keys can be really helpful. Some book, some of uh, guides have keys in them. A lot of them do. Um, so this is a, called a dichotomous key, and all that means is it. At each step in going through this, you have two choices, one or two. Does it have a central stem or is there no stem or is it a lateral stem? And if you, so then you go to the next number that it shows and it may be. So, uh, and then at each step you get, um, you get a choice of um, two choices. All right, remember uh, ecology habitat substrate, very important. So, so where and when does the fungus occur? I mean, it, is it spring, summer, fall, late fall, early, early fall? Uh, uh, where is it growing? Uh, is it in a forest? Is it uh, on a, um, is it in a meadow? Is it on a clear cut? lawn, there's a bunch of lawn mushrooms, and what kind of forest, hardwood, conifers, a mixed. Um, okay, and then what is it growing on? So you have some that grow like on the soil, it could be growing on wood, like a, uh, a dead log or, or a living tree, or it could be on a um, Leaf litter, it could be on a living plant, it could be on a rotting log, or as we saw, uh, it could be on another mushroom. And on dung, okay. And then habitat, does it occur singly? Is it in a loosely, loose group? Or are they, um, are the stems um, clustered, which means the stems are actually joined at the base? Okay, some other characteristics. Taste. So a lot of your field guides will have that as, a, as something that you check. So to do that, you take a, a little nibble of the mushroom, you roll it around on your tongue a little, and you spit it out, and you see what happens. I mean, is it, is it pleasant? Is it uh, bad, bitter taste? Uh, or is it hot like a jalapeno? Yes, there are some mushrooms that the taste is, is hot or hotter than a jalapeno. Okay, uh, and then odor. Remember, we went through a lot of these, these odors, um, anywhere from pleasant to unpleasant. The texture, soft, watery, slimy, spongy, brittle, leathery, corky so forth, okay, and then color changes. All right, we saw some color changes in the bowl eats uh, when you cut it, when you bruise it, and then we also saw that when some, um, some mushrooms, if you, if you cut them, they will, they will weep a fluid. A lot of times it's called latex. All right, so we have edible and poisonous mushrooms. So uh, this is kind of like in our, we went over before, so there's, there's only a few uh, lethal ones, uh, 15 to 30 commonly eaten ones. Okay, so uh, you probably wanna get, if you really wanna get into this, you wanna get some kind of a field guide. This is, a, there's a whole bunch of them now for different parts of the country. Uh, this is a good one. Um, this is a good one. Gary Lankoff just passed away a year or so ago. Um, 
really good for beginners and it kind of concentrates on more on those 30 edible species and the po some of the poisonous ones you need to know. And here's one that I highly recommend. Um, I was a consultant on this book and then Kathy Yarrick, one of the co-authors, is the vice president of the Minnesota Mycological Society. All right, I have to give this warning. So you ne should never ever eat a wild mushroom unless it's been absolutely positively identified to the species level. For example, white button mushroom, genus agaricus. There's about 300 species of, ag of agaricus mushroom. Some of them look pretty close to the white button mushroom, but they are toxic. So the best way to learn, um, join a mushroom club. And you can safely eat wild mushrooms. So uh, if you get into mushrooms, uh, you, you need to know the poisonous ones, especially the deadly poisonous ones. So uh, we'll cover some of those. So mushroom toxins, they can be deadly. Most of the toxins cause GI disturbances, and then some are hallucinogenic, and whether that's toxic uh, is, is a matter of opinion. And, um, you know, there's magic mushrooms. We'll see one, okay. All right, deadly mushroom. This is the death cap mushroom, so this one's caused more deaths than any other mushroom, mostly in Europe. Here you can see it has this ring on it. It has this, it's got a bulbous base surrounded by a membranous cup called a vulva. All right, so yeah, vulva and the, the veil hanging down as a ring. Okay, so here's an, some other views of it. You can see the, the cup is pretty prominent. Here you see the veil before it breaks right there all right um and this is the one in minnesota that we need to be aware of uh, although it is extremely beautiful it's called a destroying angel and it is angelic in its appearance beautiful white it's got this nice little skirt hanging down a big you know a very bulbous base and it does have a, a sack around it so there have been fatalities in the Twin Cities area among the Hmong population um, who are mycophilic and um, they have eaten these and there's been some fatalities. And here is the other main deadly mushroom that you are likely to encounter in Minnesota called the deadly gallerina. And, um, Notice that, notice this ring here. It grows on wood, uh, has a ring, and if you did a spore print on it, it would be brown. So there is a look-alike mushroom called the velvet foot mushroom. Uh, I mean, it's pretty darn similar, but you could tell the difference by doing the spore print. So the, the deadly one has a brown spore print, the uh, velvet foot has a white spore print. All right, so here's the fly garrick mushroom, beautiful, uh, found mostly out, out west um, that look like this. So we don't, they don't look like this in Minnesota, perhaps in real Northern Minnesota. Fly garrick, because uh, the story goes that, uh, um, in the olden times, uh, people used to get this mushroom, crush it up and put it in some milk in their horse bar barn where there's, and the flies would come gather, uh, sip up the milk and then they would kind of go fly around crazy and then drop dead. And it is a hallucinogenic, but a totally different kind of trip than you would get from the magic mushrooms. And it's not an easy trip. Uh, Siberian shaman use this mushroom to uh, leave their body and fly off into the spirit world to bring back information. Uh, 
So here's what the fly agaric uh, mushroom looks like in Minnesota. It has this orange, yellow, yellow orange color. And th they can be really pr pretty. Okay, beautiful, hallucinogenic. And finally, here we do have the magic mushroom. So this is Psilocybe cubensis, the most widely cultivated um, magic mushroom. And here's uh, in his natural uh, habitat, growing on his natural substrate, which is a, a cow or a, or a horse patty. Magic mushroom. And here's a, here's a, a poisonous mushroom that I'm going to point out here because um, uh, it can be mistaken for another uh, delicious edible mushroom, the chanterelle. And you, you know, if you're picking chanterelles, you really need to know about this mushroom. Notice that this is a cluster where the stems are joined at the, at the base. So jack-o'-lantern, it is orange like a jack-o'-lantern and it does glow in the dark. So the bioluminescent, there are a number of bioluminescent mushrooms. Okay, finally, we get into edible mushrooms found in Minnesota. All right, we have the foolproof four. Um, which um, these are mushrooms that are really easy to learn to identify. In fact, uh, when you leave here, you probably will know how to identify them. So we have the morel, the giant puffball, sulfur shelf, or also called chicken of the woods, and shaggy mane. We can add two more, oyster mushroom and the hen of the woods mushroom. And, and call it the safe six. So we will start off with the foolproof four number one, the beautiful morel mushroom, delicious, edible, and also the Minnesota state mushroom. We were the first state to get a state mushroom and we got the, got the morel. Okay, I have been waiting for this. Uh, I have yet to find it. So if you find one of these, you call this uh, finding the mother load. Um, so classic yellow morel, uh, true morel, I'm, we're calling it a true morel because there are false morels that are toxic. So how do you know the true from the false morel? There's only two things you, well, three things you need to know. And remember, just keep saying ridges and pits hollow, ridges and pits hollow. So here you see rid the ridges and the pits, cut it open and it's totally, totally hollow inside all the way down the stem. Um, uh, and also only in the spring, you're not, that's the only time you're gonna find uh, morels. So, the name of the of the yellow morel has been changed uh, recently. It was Marcella esculenta, now it's Marcella americana. Okay, whoa, here I forgot to make the name change. Um, anyway, so um, you know, I said um, if you're looking for morels, one of the best places to go is where there's dead elm trees, and you look around dead dead elm trees in the in the spring. Morels will come up in some, some crazy places that you would never expect. Like this, is, this guy is from East St. Paul and he found this growing in his wheel well. He brought it over, I saw it in the flesh. It was uh, simply amazing. All right, and then uh, remember to cook your morel. If you, um, if you don't cook it, you can get sick. Uh, so cook it pretty well done. Um, in fact, it's good policy to cook any any uh, mushroom, even though you know there are they are served raw in certain situations. Um, okay, false morel. Here we go. Uh, poisonous, toxic, Gyromitra esculenta. <clears throat> um, es esculent means good to good to eat. 
beefsteak morel. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, so anyway, many, many people eat this mushroom. They have eaten this mushroom, but you no need to know how to prepare it in a certain way or else you can, you can get sick. There have been fatalities. Um, so what's the difference from the true morel? Okay, instead of having ridges and pits, you just have folds. Folds and then the most noticeable is if you cut it in half, it's not hollow. It's got these chambers inside there. All right, so um, let's see, what am I seeing? Okay, so here's a couple more uh, Gyromitra esculenta. And here's the space program. And what's that got to do with any, with false morels? Well, it turns out that the, um, the toxin in false morels is monomethyl hydrazine. That is a fuel, rocket fuel, that was used uh, to land the lunar module on, on the moon. Little piece of trivia. Okay. Uh, foolproof number two, a uh, giant mushroom with this big as a soccer ball or bigger and as smooth and white on the outside as a giant, a giant puff ball, nothing else looks like that. Then if you cut it in half and it's pure snow white on the inside that means that is good to eat it starts to if it's turning starting to turn yellow at all uh it's not good it starts to have a bad odor um okay here we saw this before this is the chicken of the woods sulfur shelf mushroom a polypore uh soft and fleshy um I think I got to know. So here is a young chicken of the woods. Uh, so this one will be the whole, th this whole thing will be pretty tender. You could probably eat this whole thing. Here is a, a, a an older one. And when they get like this, um, as you, you might have, you, you know, you have a tender rim or edge on there, but then as you go inward, it gets tougher to where it's inedible. So you might just you might just want to be eating the outer the outer rim <clears throat> and it's called chicken of the woods is because it's got a a, a texture like chicken breast polypore okay let's uh try uh can't even i don't know anyway it is um there are little tiny pores on it um Okay. All right. There, oh, there, there they are. All right. Okay. Chicken of the woods, you can find in huge quantities. You can find 50 pounds at a time. Um, they are a really good edible mushroom. Foolproof four, number four, shaggy mane. So these are cylindrical, the cap, a cylindrical cap. And with the, sh uh, they're shaggy, uh, scaly like things on there. And uh, looky here, it's starting to turn a little black here. And that's because the, the shaggy mane is in a group of mushrooms, uh, number of species called inky caps. and and these mushrooms, if they're um, with e either within days or even hours, um, they will turn into a, uh, a puddle of black goo. And um, here is just starting. These, are, these would be okay. Um, I mean, some people do eat them. Some people even eat the, when, they're, when they're in the inky stage. So anyway, uh, here, sometimes they can come up in big clusters like this in disturbed areas. Sometimes they come up in, you know, singly in a, in a lawn. Uh, and here's what happens when they uh, turn to ink. By the way, you, this ink can be used uh, put in a fountain pen. You can write with it. Okay, now we move on to the safe six. We'll put the oyster mushroom in there. 
uh, oyster mushroom is a wood wood rotting mushroom grows on wood um, and it has a gill, it's a gilled mushroom kind of a shelf like gilled mushroom the gills run has very little stem the the, the gills run down the stem and can have like overhanging uh, shelf like structure uh, you can grow them at home pretty easily. Uh, the cap can can vary in color from white to tan to gray, or even even a bluish color. Lateral stem growing on wood, decurrent gills, spore print important. Uh, it will be white, sometimes a pale lilac color, and then. In the spring, when they're growing on aspen trees, uh, they they may have this anise, pretty pleasant anise smell, and the taste is is mild. Also, if you see this little black, red red headed black, orange headed black beetle, uh, you prop you know uh, you have a oyster mushroom because this this beetle exclusively feeds on uh, oyster mushrooms. Okay, where are we now? Oh, here we go. So this is, uh, I just found this last, a month ago on looking for morels. This, this is, a, this is uh, Pleurotus populinus uh, growing, on a, growing on an aspen tree. And here's uh, a dead upright uh, tree with a nice bunch of uh, oyster mushrooms. Safe, um, safe six, number six, um, hen of the woods, a really good, very uh, favorite mushroom of many, many people. Um, it is a polypore. It grows at the base of old oak trees. Um, and if you turn it over, you look underneath it, it has a white pore surface, little, little tiny pores um base of large oaks and um um and it's a good medicinal mushroom also if you're lucky you can find an, an oak tree that has a bunch of them and like uh, is pot one of these uh cluster hen, hen of the woods can weigh up to 20 or 30 pounds Okay, now here is a mushroom that if you're you're out looking for morels and and you don't find morels, you will find this mushroom. It's really getting getting plentiful now. It's getting more plentiful, probably because of climate change. It was strictly in the spring, but now we're seeing it later into the summer and even in the in the early fall. Um, it's called the dryad saddle or pheasant back mushroom, and it's a polypore. So here's what it looks like. Here you can see where it gets the pheasant back name, and um, here you see it has pretty large pores on it for a for a polypore, very large pores, and um, um, polyporus squamosus in the old books. So here's the new name, Syriaporus. Um, Okay, and one of the identifying features and cool things is that it has a watermelon scent. All right. Um, okay, we have uh, the King Bowley. We saw this before. It's a one, it is a wonderful choice, edible. We do find it in Minnesota. Um, Here's another view. Um, again, so the pore surface uh, is very small, like we saw before. Um, what else? Another identifying feature that is hard to see on some of them, you, you can almost always find it up around the, the top of the stem, you'll find a kind of a net-like uh, stuff, a netting called reticulations. Um, and here's one that's where it's really pronounced. So that's what it looks like, only it's lots more subtle on, on some of the 
the king believes. And here is another big bow leaf that's a popular edible mushroom um, um, called the, uh, the bicolor bow leaf. And this one is tricky because uh, there's one that looks really similar that is toxic. All right, golden chanterelle. This is a favorite of lots of people. We do have lots of them in our area. Um, golden chanterelle. Okay, um, so the, the chanterelle looks like it has gills, but these are actually fake, fake gills, false gills. Instead of gills, they are actually folds in the membrane. And uh, here you can see up close here, you can see they're blunt on the edges are blunt as opposed to being sharp and knife-like. And uh, so the gills run down the stem, the flesh, and you cut it open will be, uh, will be white. Odor, actually we're talking about odors. We have an apricot-like odor with them. Uh, here's a nice day of, of uh, chanterelle hunting. And here's the jack-o'-lantern again. So they like to farm around, they seem to grow off of roots of uh, trees. And so they cluster with the, um, usually with the uh, base of the stems joined together. And if you look at the pore, I mean, if you look at the uh, gills, the gills will be sharp and knife-like. So there you can see. All right. Um, black trumpet, another really good edible mushroom that we that we can find in our state and Wisconsin. Um, these are hollow, so they're they're hollow tubular going all the way down. So that's where it gets its trumpet trumpet name related to the um, morel the very pretty powerful uh, flavor so that a few of these can give your dish a lot of flavor all right honeycap mushrooms we saw one of these before so these are these mushrooms are not that easy to identify they can be quite very in fact um, what we used to call Honeycaps, Armillaria, and Melia has been broken up into, I don't know, a bunch of different other species uh, because some of them are, are actually different, but they, they are the genus Armillaria. And in gen, com, the common name is for all of them are, is honeycap mushrooms. So they grow on wood, um, you know, maybe at the base of a stump. Um, Sometimes on they might they may be growing on the ground, but they're probably growing from uh, buried wood. And this is the Armillaria melia, the classic. So it has this yellow honey-like color. And this one, it also has another feature of this one is it has clusters with the stems tending to be joined. And here's the one that looks pretty different. Um, this one is actually the uh, humongous fungus is made of, of that species, I'm pretty sure. Okay. And this one is especially important that you cook it thoroughly because it has a toxin that the heat breaks down. Okay. Mushrooms with teeth. Okay. Here is a, uh, this is a hedgehog mushroom. Uh, with teeth. This is a really good edible mushroom. It's also related to chanterelles, maybe a little similar, not quite as fruity, nutty flavor. Um, and here, uh, so the teeth on this one are running down the stem a little. And it turned there. So there's here's one that we that we that has gotten a new name, uh, and you can see it's a little different. The color's a little different, but it's still a, you know it's a, it's a hedgehog, good edible. Okay, the mushrooms with teeth. Okay, hericium. So these mushrooms uh, they are being cultivated. I see that sometimes you can find them in, in uh, 
store uh, co-ops uh, and um, <clears throat> excuse me um, flea markets um, farmers markets so uh, they th this this one is really uh, fleshy fleshy in its texture it's a ball is fleshy and it's white and it actually tastes like um, like crab and here's Herisium americanum again also tastes like crab and Herisium coralloides also uh, we got a uh, we found a whole log covered with these things and we got these and made made crab cakes out of them and they were really pretty good Here's one that you may find in the fall. It is edible, but might if some when it gets like this, it might be too tough. Called the elm cap, but it does not grow on elm trees. For you know where it got that, how it got that name. It and in our area, it grows almost exclusively on box elders, usually coming out of a knot hole or a wound on the on the box elder. So remember, we talked about uh, milky caps. So you cut the gills and a fluid or latex called, comes out. It can be a certain color. And this one is uh, the indigo milky, where the latex is a beautiful blue color. It is edible, actually. Um, here's one cut in half, it turns blue. All right, so here we have two mushrooms that look almost identical. It, it sometimes is almost impossible to tell them, tell them apart just by looking, looking at them. However, so this one, is a, this one is a good, really good edible. This one is poisonous. So this is where the spore print comes in. So uh, if you did a spore print, you'd have a white spore print here, this one has a green spore print. When it gets older, the, the gills actually turn a little green. All right, bluets, late fall mushroom, excellent mushroom, um, late fall. And uh, it has a pale pinkish spore print. Uh, it's a choice edible. However, there's false bluets that are, to are toxic. And these are cortinaria, so they have this, the cortina on it. You can see this web-like uh, stuff covering the gills that then when it opens up, it may almost totally go, go away. So here is a bluet, and here is a false bluet, and uh, boy, they look a lot alike. Let's zero in here. and. Uh, Let's see, okay, you can see some of this cobwebby stuff is left, and then right here is where the, uh, some spore, brown spores have fallen down on there. So this is where um, the spore print again. So make that spore print, so, so you would have a white spore print and the good one and the true bluet and the false bluet. All right, another really popular edible mushroom is the lobster mushroom, which is actually a big gilled mushroom that has been attacked by another fungus called Hypomyces lactiflorium. So um, here is the host fungus, and here's what it's like when it gets parasitized. It may turn it into just an orange lump. You looked at it with a magnifying glass, uh, you would see it has these little pimples. It's an ascomycete, and so the, sp the spores form in these little, these little flask-like shaped things. All right, lobster, or wait a minute, lobster um, host, Russula breva peas. Russula breva peas is, uh, kind of a real bland tasting mushroom. The texture's really not very good. Uh, the lobster mushroom has a nice firm texture and a really good flavor. 
Finally, I'm gonna think I'm gonna end with Chaga. Chaga has gotten tremendously popular in recent years. You're seeing it everywhere, uh, products with Chaga. And this is what it looks like in, in nature. Um, grows on uh, birch trees, uh, paper birch, also on yellow birch. Um, and it's this black, burnt looking thing. It's also called a, a clunker polypore. Uh, clunker is a term where most people are not familiar with what's left behind when you burn coal. Uh, anyway, so this is not actually, this is not a spore producing mushroom. So, so the, the fungus is in this tree and then it forms these like tumor like things which consist of the the mycelium plus wood tissue in a big tumor like stuff. And um, anyway, it's being sold in all kinds of products. So here is um, one of those products, Lion's Mane. By the way, I didn't say with Lion's Mane is a, is a good medicinal mushroom. It is good for cognitive functioning. And there have been studies which suggest that it may be uh, good for uh, dementia and uh, Alzheimer's. All right, that's all folks, goodbye.